how do you redefine? How do you redefine your business? And I'm looking at the five radical defining stages of your business. The five radical redefining stages of your business. And as I get started, let me acknowledge our graduates from DLN Entrepreneurship Institute. Please, you may stand and please give them a round of applause. Congratulations and we wish you well. Congratulations and we wish you well. So, the five radical redefining stages of your business. The starting point is this. I stand on two things. Number one, it is to see how we can have a number of us think of entrepreneurship. A number of us think of entrepreneurship because I believe that entrepreneurs are national assets that should be cultivated and motivated. If a number of us became entrepreneurs, if Zambia produced a number of entrepreneurs, the landscape would be totally different from what we are seeing today. It would be totally different. And let me give a little list of where we are coming from so that you just get a rough idea of why we behave the way we behave and the way and why we think the way we think. 1964, we, we got our independence. After getting our independence, our leaders decided to utilize the reserves that we had to offer services that they had, uh, you know, promised before elections. So they got to utilize uh, the reserves to give free education, uh, bring about infrastructure and development, and they brought all these things to our fore. Which was great. 1968, there was then the Mulungushi economic reforms, which brought about what is known as Zambianization. At that point, the government decided that we are going to own the industries. We are going to control the means of production. So 1968, there was Mulungushi economic reforms. 19, um, uh, 69, there, there was the Madero economic reforms. What they basically did was they created the big industries to be run by the government. And that was the time we had the likes of Indeco, Vindeco, Mindeco, all these big conglomerates were owned by the government. And this became the source of employment to many people who are then moving to the city because we are a huge exodus towards urbanization. Now at that point, because everything was owned by the government, the spirit of entrepreneurship was unheard of. It was completely unheard of. Why? Because the biggest employer was the government. The big industries were run by the government. So everything depended on the government. Now, during that same period, it became apparent that the spirit of entrepreneurship was completely killed. And this went on up until 1991. So before 1991, the, the economic uh, policies that we had as a country were pro-socialists, uh, meaning much was dependent on the government. So 1991, big strength, we went uh, to a free market economy where now you can run your businesses as individuals, you can come up with your big companies as individuals, and you realize that after 1991, that is when we had companies like Madison, you, you know, coming in, Aflife coming in, Zandit coming in, uh, Neko coming in. All these companies only came into existence after 1991. But for the majority of the citizen, things changed towards a free market economy, but the mindset still remained pro-socialist, still looking up to the government. And that is why, for most things, we still look back and say, Boma, Why? Because we still believe that
that for our lives to be better, the government must be fully involved. Despite having changed, our mindset has still remained that way. But I really say I will do that. We are no longer going back there. It is clear that for you to succeed, you must look at yourself. The economy that we are looking at is pro-capitalist. It is so dependent on yourself. And you need to have that thing in. Because when it was pro-socialist, there was free education, great, not, no problem with that. Exercise books were free. Almost all things were free. But even now, we still want that kind of a thing. That is why for everything, we still feel that the government must do everything and anything. So that mindset must change. And I stand on this. If there are people that will make this change, it is yourself and myself. And I was seeing a post not too long ago, it should be a day or two ago. I am sure you could have seen that post where there was my face and the face of the chairman. I know who the chairman is. Huh? My face and the face of who? Chairman. And the question was, uh, who loves you more? Ah, who, ah, who saw that post? <laughs> it's like you saw it. Now, here's something interesting. So I'll just call him chairman, uh, just to avoid, you know, mentioning names. Chairman. One entrepreneur. Just one. One entrepreneur. Sunday is talking. Everyone is confused. One entrepreneur. Now imagine if a number of us stood and we had a number of us become successful as entrepreneurs. Don't you realize that we can change the landscape of this nation? So it is not an issue of comparison or in fact I can't even be compared. I mean that is chairman. So <laughs> Yeah. But that is the power of entrepreneurship. So what I believe and what I am championing is that you see, our mindset has been this way. How about if you went the route of entrepreneurship and produced a number of chairmen around this place? The landscape of this country will be totally different. Will be totally different. That is the power of entrepreneurship. And I hope to inspire others to do exceptional things that inspire them so that ultimately, together, we may build companies, the economy, and the world where trust and loyalty are a norm and not an exception. That is what I'm looking forward to. And congratulations to all of you for turning up and you may give ourselves a round of applause as we tell that it is a presentation for today. The lessons that we'll be looking at today, there are some questions that I want us to respond to. The questions I would like to have addressed today are, how can I get my business to work but without me? How can my business work without me? How can I get my people to work but without my constant interference? How can the business be replicated? So you are running a business, how can it be replicated? How can it get to be so huge? And finally, how can I own my business and still be free? from it. So I should impress that today's presentation is not motivational. It is not about, yeah, you can make it. You can do it. Uh-uh. I am calling for your brains, your attention. Let us put it here and discuss business. This is a master class. So I would call for you to engage in this and follow me closely 
So there are five things that I'm going to share, and these are the five radical redefining stages of your business. Step number one, redefining your idea. Redefining your idea. Have you ever had an idea that sounds so complex and you can't put pieces together? And you are wondering, can this idea work or can it not work? When you are asking yourself all those many questions around your idea. Have, have, have you been there before? I've seen a number of people who then ask, I have this much money, but I have no idea. What ideas do you have that I can invest in? What can I do? I need to have an idea. There are others who have this idea and they are asking, can this idea really work? Can this idea really be profitable? There are such questions. But today, I want to break it down. So how do you come up with this idea? How do you refine your idea? So there are two ways on how you can refine your idea. So number one, the backward strategy. The backward strategy. An idea that you think of, run it through what I call the backward strategy. So how does the backward strategy work like? You start from the end, you start from the desired end, then you work backwards to the first end. You start from the very end, then you work backwards to the first step. So first, you ask the key question. I have this idea. Then the question is, who will buy this product or service? That is the end. Who will buy this product or service? So you start from the very end. When you answer the question of who will buy, then you move to the uh, scenario before that question. And that will be, what am I supposed to do for this person to buy this product or service? So the answer will be, they will have to know about this product or service. Then the question is, how are they going to know? Then that brings it on how you can market to those would be buyers. Okay, fine. Now you know how you can market to those would be buyers. You move a step back. How can I make this product or service? How can I provide this product or service? Then at that particular point, uh, you then say, okay, fine. It's either I'll make this, or maybe I will, you know, buy to resell. Okay, fine. If you are to buy to resell, where are you going to get the source? What would be the source for this particular product? So then you decide, okay, fine, it will be local or China. So you are looking at this using the backwards strategy. We are starting from the end, working on this backwards. And every idea that you might think of, look at it this way. Start it from the very end, who buy this product? Because sometimes people have, you know, very interesting ideas. Very, very interesting ideas. But they fail to answer the basic line. Who is going to buy this product or this service? That is extremely important. If you can answer that, and you can dissect precisely who will buy that, then you have done so much more. Here's an example. One lady comes through and she was making um, very nice handbags. And these handbags are made from um, uh, uh, Chitenge material. Properly sewn, very, very neat. Then she says, I have this idea of selling these little nice handbags where you can put your goodies in. Then I question and say, okay, fine, so who will buy 
what kind of a market are you looking at? Who will buy this product? Then she, she wasn't so clear. Because clearly, a slave queen won't buy that. I mean, that's a fact. A slave queen doesn't buy a steak here and back, right? <laughs> All right, so the big question was who will you buy? Then, after discussions, it was clear that a young lady, maybe, maybe not. Uh, so, it, it wasn't so clear up until we devised a way to say maybe people that can possibly buy this during you know, December holidays. People want to give gifts, so companies can put their food, you know, their wines, their cakes, their biscuits, and their whatnot in these in these goodie bags, and I believe it can sell. All right, fine. If companies do that, what kind of companies are you looking at? What we are what we are trying to establish was who will buy. The number the budget for. We found that companies like, you know, the big blue chip companies who love giving such goodies and want to feel more African, more Zambian, they seem to be a bigger market. So then they were met and she decided to approach some banks. Uh, so okay, fine, maybe banks can actually buy this. Or maybe these big blue chip companies can actually buy these banks. And at the point, after, after finalizing on that, then the next question was, okay, now you have identified who can buy this. How are they going to know about this? And the marketing strategy to be utilized was to respond to that. And what was the plan? The plan was to approach them. Because there are certain businesses where you do not necessarily have to go through mass marketing social media and whatnot, great it can work, but for certain businesses, you just have to go straight to the actual clients. So then we identified or now she can reach out to those. Then we went backwards. How are you going to have the men? Or are you going to import them or have the men? Okay, fine, I'll have the men. Okay, fine. Where are you going to get the materials from? Is it from uh, within Lusaka, Safiki, or you buy from China? Okay, fine. Meantime, I'll buy from Safiki. So we went on me backwards. Fast forward, she was able to access the materials, see people that she could produce with, talk to the banks, and was able to supply. The key thing is that any idea and how you get to redefine on this is to use the backwards strategy. That is one. Then two, as we are thinking of that particular idea, watch the environment. Watch the environment. You see, it is not just an issue of coming up with an idea. The question is that, watch the environment. Here is something interesting. The Zambian capital market is very small. Very, very small. And I'll say this in a blanket statement. It's a blanket statement. And the statement is, if with your idea, the idea that you have, if it will not be able to give you the funds, the revenue to sustain itself within six months, forget about it. If your idea cannot give you money to sustain itself within six months, forget about it. You can only pursue that idea with an exception of one, you have a source of money that makes it possible to keep funding it, one. Or two, you have a lot of money that you can invest in that particular idea. I've seen a number of people who have ideas and brilliant ideas, but they go halfway they run out of money and they are not fully implemented and they just lose it. Here's something interesting. Such cases work in certain markets, not the Zambian market. You see, in these big economies, you notice one thing. I'll give an example of, you know, 
Google, or even WhatsApp, WhatsApp that you are utilizing. By the time WhatsApp was being sold to Facebook for $19 billion, WhatsApp wasn't profitable. This is a company being sold for $19 billion and it is not profitable. How does the market work that side so that you just get to a verified deal? So in a simplified version, this is very simplified so that you just get to a verified deal. Of course it is more intricate than this, but I'll simplify it this way just for you to understand how the capital market went that side and why such ideas are difficult to implement in Zambia. So you come up with an idea and this is how they make their money. So you come up with an idea, all right fine, I want to come up with an app that can do A, B, C. I want to come up with an app, all right friend. You talk to your friend, uh, we can record this and this will be great and it will change the, uh, the narrative and work on. So you get together and you come up with your friend and you tell your friend, okay fine, put in a 50,000, you know, quarter as an example. 50,000 quarter, I have an idea. So you come together, form a company, you put in a 50,000 and I've put in the idea and we start running with the 50,000. So we are still perfecting the app. As we are perfecting it, we approach angel investors uh, who possibly can in. When they see the potential of the app, then they come in and say, okay, um, so how is the share out for the top field? Now we have 50, 50 percent. All right, fine. I need 30 percent in, in this particular business. But what I'm going to do, or maybe I'll put in, I'll, I'll need 40%, but what I'll do is that I'll put in 700,000 quarter. So 700,000 quarter is pumped in the business and you've given up um, 40% to this investor. Then as you, are, as you keep on perfecting that up, a venture, you know, capital firm comes in and says, okay, fine, this looks great. This is what we have been looking at. So what we are going to do, we'll do this. We'll put in 20 million so that we can put it on the market. We get it set for the market. So 20 million is put in. Now notice this thing. As those monies are coming in the business, you who started with the 50,000, your net worth is growing. But you're not making money from that idea. You're not making money at all. What is changing is that the bigger investors are coming in, they are putting in money. As a result, your net worth is increasing. And it goes on and on to a point that you notice, as an example, YouTube was bought for $1.6 billion when it was not making any money at all. 1.6 billion dollars but how would they pay for for uh for something that is not making money and pay so much money it is for a simple reason they saw the potential and they picked it up from there and that is how the market went that side the same what's up the example that i gave it was the same thing bought for 19 billion dollars and it wasn't making money it was only afterwards that Facebook found a way of monetizing when it was connected to Facebook and they only found a way of monetizing. Of course, you might even ask questions like, uh, how are they making money on WhatsApp when, uh, you see, I don't, I don't pay for it. So they found a way of connecting it to the Facebook platform and the rest is risky. And if you look at most of the companies from that side, example, Tesla. Tesla was in existence for 19 years. Now, notice, this is very interesting. Tesla in existence for 19 years and it had never made a single profit. And the owner of Tesla was the second richest man in the world. Second richest man in the world with a company that has been running for 19 years and it hasn't made a profit. It's for a simple reason. The way the capital markets went that side, 
is totally different from here. So here, if your idea cannot give you money in six months, it is extremely difficult for you to go for it. If I'm to advise, except if you have backup, forget about it. Forget about it because the way things work here is totally different. So the first point was that how do you redefine your idea? How do you position your idea? First thing, use the backward strategy. The number two, be sure to watch the environment. Because, well, uh, because I tend to interact with a number of entrepreneurs, I've seen very interesting ideas. Ideas that have not even considered the environment. One guy comes and says, I have this idea. This idea is very powerful. It is the next big thing, okay? This thing, once it gets on the market, it will take Facebook out of the market. Ah. <laughs> so now we are listening to like you. Which which masters have you used on this idea? I'm just thinking to myself. So watch the environment. Look at the environment. And certain guys would come in very interesting ideas. No, I want to come up with an app on a click. People can come through and get garbage from you and yeah, just on a click. So when garbage is collected, just click on a click, you know, people come and collect garbage. Okay, so who is going to pay for that? How is it going to work? How are you going to reach to them? And how are you going to operationalize that? How are you going to... Just the key basic questions a person doesn't, uh, doesn't have answers to that. So whichever idea running through these two things. Having said that, we'll go to the second thing. Redefine your operations. Redefine your operations. Now this is looking at those that are starting their business or they are pushing their business to the next level. So the first question is, where do you envision? your business? Where do you see your business? So as you redefine your operations, the first thing you need to answer is that, where do you envision your business? There's one interesting man who said something very interesting, and his name was Watson, you know, at the founder of IBM. At the helm of IBM, he said this, the reason IBM has been so successful was that once I had the picture of how IBM would look when the dream was in place and how such a company would have to act, I then realized that unless we began to act that way from the very beginning, we would never get there. This guy said, the moment I envisioned what I wanted to achieve with IBM, the moment I saw where I wanted to take this company, the moment I envisioned that, and how such a company is supposed to act, I then decided to start acting that way today. Why? Because if you are to get there, you must start acting that way today. So the question is, how do you envision your business? Where are you seeing your business two years from now, or five years from now. Just take a moment to think about it. Where do you want to take this business? What do you want to achieve? What levels do you want to attain with your business? Take a moment to think about it. The challenge that we tend to have is that we are okay playing in the small league. No, it is okay. We are just existing this way. You are just scared of thinking. When you are questioned, uh, so, uh, so how is your business and where are you want to take it? I know God will lead the way. Huh? <laughs> God is not in the business of leading the way for businesses. You have to think, envision, and see where you want to take your business. See where you want to take your business. Don't be comfortable with small things. People that have achieved exceptional things, we are human beings just like yourself and myself. Where do you envision your business to be? And that is the key thing. 
But don't try to say, no, we are here, and you see, this is better than nothing. And people are saying, this, this is better than nothing. And I have really get that line. I don't like that line, the line of better than nothing. Why should nothing be your benchmark? Why should you be referring to nothing? Are you, are you bad to know? Why should nothing be your why should nothing be the best for you? No, it is better than nothing. Very apologetic. Where do you envision your business? Why should you compare your business to nothing? So the key question as we get you to define your operations. Answer the question of where do you envision your business to be? Take a moment to think about this and I should get that like thinking is hard. Thinking is hard work, but you need to do that hard work of thinking. Just envision, where can we be? Where can I take this business? Where am I pushing this agenda? What would I like to see? You need to respond to that question. Once you've assessed, as you are defining your operations, number one, see where you want to take your business to, envision where you want to take your business. Once you have done that, get to have a franchise prototype. Now you are defining your operations. The franchise prototype. The franchise prototype. So I'll share a little story. So there was a man called Ray Kroc. This man used to sell uh, milkshake machines, and this was in 1952. And he decided, well, two, two brothers decided to buy a milkshake machine. So as this guy was delivering this milkshake machine now to these two brothers, he noticed something that really surprised him. These guys were selling hamburgers. You know, hamburgers. As they were selling these hamburgers, there was a queue of people queuing up to buy the hamburgers. And the people who were selling these hamburgers were kids, you know, basically teens. They are the ones who are selling these hamburgers, selling this queue. Then this guy looked at that and realized that this is, this is something very interesting. Something very, very interesting. Because the hamburgers were sent quickly, so it was very quick, efficient, inexpensive, and identical. So the hamburgers looked the same, they were sent very fast, and just the way it was done, the man was so excited. And he talked to these two brothers to say, listen up, can I franchise the way you are doing your business, your business method? May I franchise this so that I can be selling hamburgers the same way you are selling them? And can I do that? Then the guy, of course, was given the franchise when he convinced the two brothers, Mark and Jim McDonald. Fast forward, now he got back and bought off the two brothers and he got to own the McDonald's brand. Now this is something that I want to put to your attention. Within 40 years, McDonald's became the most successful small business in the world, worth over 40 billion dollars, with over 38,000 restaurants in over 120 uh, uh, countries. Now, the reason why I'm giving this example of McDonald's, that brought in a change, it had a generational change on our business is done. It brought about a generational change on the franchise, you know, the franchise business. And that is why we have over 500,000 franchises across the world. We have KFC, Debonairs, and the, all these are franchises. Now, this is how franchises work, because that is where I want you to pick lessons from. Franchises work this way. 
I'll give an example of debonairs. The debonairs you see by the roundabout in Hero's roundabout. And the debonairs which is in Kapili. It is not owned by the same company. It is not owned by the same company. The people running these two, they are totally different. And the one running the Bonaire in Kamloka is totally different from this one. All these companies have franchises. But here's something interesting. If you eat your pizza from the Bonaire here, then you get to eat your pizza from the Bonaire in Kapili. The taste is the same. The ambience when you enter the Bonaire is the same. Everything is the same. And you don't even know that the owners are totally different. You don't know that. You don't know that. And this is the same story of KFC. When you eat from KFC in Kitwe, eat from KFC here, you might assume that it's the same company. The owners are totally different. But what is the same? What is the same is the system. Those businesses are system dependent businesses, not people dependent businesses. And that is why McDonald's has over 38,000 outlets across the globe. But if you eat in McDonald's here and you eat in McDonald's in South Africa, the taste, the treatment, and everything is the same. Why? They went on the system. They behave the same way. They act the same way. The business is system dependent. But for you, with your one company, you fail to be consistent. Why? Because your company is people dependent and not system dependent. So if you are to redefine and reposition your business, there is serious need to redefine your operations. And I'll give an, an example. I went for a haircut, went for a haircut, um, and when I got to the, you know, mall, I was treated so well. I never used to go to that particular mall. I will not mention the mall for obvious reasons. I never used to go that side, but it was almost sunset, and the following day, I had a very important meeting that I was supposed to attend to. Wow, don't worry, because sometimes people get worried, so what are they talking about? It's just something simple. And the gentleman says the cable was tucked out, and he wants to get memorable pictures, and he can't get memorable pictures with the cables hanging from behind. Thank you for being such a powerful business person. Yeah, that is good, that is good. So, go to this um, barber shop, uh, because it seemed to be the one that was nearby. And I was super impressed. Got that side, the guy, you know, rubbed my hair with, you know, a hot towel. After rubbing it, he combed it. After combing it, you know, and he got to cut it. And he was so meticulous. He did it extremely well where you are seeing that this guy is doing a very good job. Very careful, very caring. You know, I was cutting my hair, and I was paying attention and feeling so cool. After cutting my hair uh, with the machine, he came with the scissors. Now, you see, for some of us that actually grew up in the village, you know, back there, we used to cut our hair with the scissors. <laughs> uh, so when we moved to having our hair cut with the machine, it, it was a huge achievement. But now, when this guy cut with the machine, then decided to use the scissors on my head. I was like, this guy knows what he's doing. This guy is powerful. And the guy was so meticulous. He did a very good job, very careful. And I was super impressed 
as if that was not enough, I will go to where you know my hair was to be washed. Proper hot water, and my hair is being washed with the first shampoo, the second shampoo, then with the third shampoo, he decides, you know, to begin massaging my hair. You know, massaging my hair, and I'm feeling, and you see that feeling you need to close your eyes. Eyes closed. I am feeling the feeling of a good treatment. A week later, you see here I go so fast. I was so quick. Got back to the barber shop. And something interesting happens. This time around, my hair is not, you know, wrapped with a hot cloth to begin with. My hair is cut with a machine, not a scissors. When washing just one shampoo, ba ba ba, I'm next to go. <laughs> of course, it was fine. My hair was well cut, but I was disappointed. Why was I disappointed? I had experienced something better. In as the experience that I got is the normal one, I was dissatisfied and I was frustrated. And I vowed not to go back. But then I realized that that barber shop didn't have a system. It wasn't system dependent. It was people dependent. So you can't run your business depending on the moods of people that are there. You have to run your business based on the system that you have created. If you invest your time to work on the system, when a customer walks in, this is what you do. List those things. Everything must be all listed. When a customer walks in, this is what you do. After this, this is what you do. This is what you do. This is what you do. When you do that, it makes it easier for you to replicate that business somewhere else. One, it makes it a lot more easier for people to be satisfied and to come back. Two, it finally makes it easier for people to know what to expect. Because if you walk in unreliable, because it is systems based, once you get there, you get the conversation. It is just the same. It is systems dependent. And those guys with those things, I would want to get on the other side one day. Because the way they press, they press that thing many times. I don't know what they do there. But look what the question is. Chili or not chili? Okay. Is it upside? Questions are the same. Why it has been programmed that way? It is a system. So if you go to Hungry Lion here and go to another Hungry Lion, the way you will be treated and how everything will work out is just about the same. Just about the same. Now, when your business is systems dependent, you will not worry about losing employees. I think you see how this ties up with the third point. You will not worry about losing employees because your business is not people dependent. It is systems dependent. So if there's something that you need to build, take your time to build simple, basic systems. How do we do this? How do we respond to this? How do you work on this? Once you work on that, it will help out with consistency. And you need to realize that systems are the ones that run businesses. And people run systems. So it is extremely important that you notice that. Let us not come to your business. Today you are treating us this way. The following day you are treating us that way. When you are not at your business, I can't get a discount only when you are there. Have a proper system. When a person wants a discount, it's 5% standard. When things happen this way, it is standard. Have a proper system. Invest in a system. And it matters less how small your business is you can develop a simple, basic system. Be consistent. Be consistent. What time to open? 
what time to close, what time to do what, what time to... Let there be consistent. Is that clear? All right, so the second point was redefining your operations. The first thing, where do you envision your business? Then the second thing, the franchise prototype. Come up with a franchise prototype for your business. Such that if an effort is to be handed over to someone else, your business will still be able to operate. And those businesses that are business are the ones uh, uh, that can exist in the realm of life. Because it is not people dependent, it is system dependent. When you are sick and you are unable to report for work, the business will still go because it is system dependent and not people dependent. When you lose a valuable employee, your business won't close down because your business is system dependent and not people dependent. So go back and come up with um, a prototype, a franchise prototype. So that was the second one. There are, there are just the five of them. Then the third one, redefining your employees. So the first one, we looked clearly at redefining your idea. The second one, uh, redefining your operations. Then the third one, redefining your employees. You see, employees can make you or break you. Employees are the ones that can make you or break you. And I remember in 2017, getting to 20, 2018, I decided to employ three people at DLN Technologies. So I decided to employ... <coughs> yes, that was a loud one. <laughs> I decided to employ three people. One in, in, in the technical space, one to do um, marketing and the other one to do sales. We advertised and people came through, you know, applied. And time for interviews came, so we shortlisted. Uh, so we shortlisted and time for interviews came. And remember, we want to employ how many people? Three people. Interviews came through and I was so impressed with how people perform that side in terms of interviews. One guy during interviews, ah, said very interesting things. He said, you see, I see your business going very far. In fact, uh, in five years to 10 years, I'm seeing this business in a mouth story beauty. And on top of it, there will be a helipad, uh, you know, landing where, where a helicopter lands. I can see that. I have seen this. Now I say to this guy, have you ever been motivated? You who is at the view motivated? A person is seeing your business. Where are you? You have not seen it. Think, ah, this guy, we can't lose this guy. This guy must be employed. So the guy is in. No, this other one comes in and uh, this fellow was very honest and the way he was answering, he seemed to be a very sincere guy. And I was like, I think in a company we need very sincere guys who have integrity and what not. No, this guy must as well be employed. Ah, the third one, this guy comes in, I think that guy may be a motivation really comes and motivates the panel. You know, super motivated as a panel, and you even start thinking, what have you been doing with our life? So this guy has been employed. Fast forward, 12 people are employed instead of three. We, we, we wanted to leave out some, but you're like, no, but you can't leave this one. No, but this one, why are you part? No, this one has to be there. No, this, uh, this one will be better than I think this guy has, has the vision, he will push our business very far. And this one who looks like a church, church, my link. Uh, we need such guys because no one is still here. We need them. Finally, 12 people employed against the budget. 
Uh, after employing, then you say, okay, fine, for 12 people, uh, I think they are too much for, for our operations here. What we need to do is, let us open a branch, Copper Ground. So we decide to open a branch, bought a fleet of vehicles, and send it, uh, you know, one with the Copper Ground, and operations begin here. And here's what was happening in my mind. How employees can actually work out? In my mind, I was, we are about to launch. Here we are about to go. Not to these jokes I've been doing all these years. Now I have a big team, a huge team, a powerful team, and then we are about, you know, about 18, 18 to 21. Now, of course, um, our company is different. There are those companies, of course, at the same time I was running a construction business and that one had a workforce of about 300. But you see, a construction business, most of the employees that side are labor based and whatnot. So even when the numbers are high, now it is not a big deal. But having 18 qualified people at this business, ah, I knew that here we are going. Here we are safe and to go very far. Very motivated, a fleet of vehicles branded. And of course, then there was no red drop. <laughs> but those that were there were branded. Powerful and I was feeling it. Yeah, when we started running. Life can be so unfair sometimes. Employees should not be there. The chief of the copper board, one guy who was a very good guy during interviews. We just discovered that using our company vehicle, our company resources, he forms another company which is competing with our company. <laughs> <laughs> and he's using our company resources to go market for his company. And the fella is doing this and you're not seeing sales coming through. And of course, even in Rusaka, when we are starting out, you know, the went view went so hard. One. Then two, I didn't want excuses. So every Monday morning, all vehicles, full time. When is there? Some are coming back and no few are finished. Ah, around the airport. But again, I didn't want to ask because in my mind, we are launching to the next level. So this is what happens with the next level, but I'm all scaling up. So my thinking is that we are having fun. This is the next level. When is the fuel is done? This guy will come up with sales are not coming in. Because this fella has formed a company and they have no idea. I only got to discover afterwards when one of the team members, I think also he was also, you know, not so wise. He put address on his WhatsApp status for the new company, which is competing with our company. You know, we supply these machines and you know we print these things and whatnot. So one guy sees it. But boss, it seems there's a there's a company inside. After interrogating we we found that they had even negotiated and bought a machine from our company for himself and negotiated very interesting payment terms. This guy who is refunding this business and is running the business. I was so hurt and I felt so bad. So that is on the copper ground. Then the guy in Lusaka, also something very interesting happened. One guy is in the sales. I just hear that we saw your vehicle. It is coming from this side of my 10 miles. Very early in the morning. You know? Uh, we reported eight hours, but around six, seven. Now we saw your vehicle. It was loaded. People inside the pub, it seems it had loaded bags of rape behind or something like that. People who are going for orders. Ah, are you serious? I think a car was like this. One of the team members with the company vehicle has decided to be a transporter. <laughs> using a company here. The other one, one who had promised us the helper. So this guy was driving uh, 
a de Subaru, so, so they need to have a Subaru. And Subaru, you know, Subaru is a pretty prestigious name. Uh, this guy over the weekend, uh, I don't know what happened, seems to have been involved in an accident, then decided to panel beat, you know, the fender, just a quick one, just quick panel vision, like quick panel beating, and it comes back to the office and we are nowhere of knowing. It was up until some time that I received a call. Uh, sir, uh, this is from Rata. Uh, you bashed another person's vehicle. Me? Ah, no. Because all the vehicles were registered in my name and that, and that my cell number. No, you bashed another person. Then we just discovered that this fella actually bashed other people and ran away. And it was only then that I learned that this guy actually drinks. I had no idea. Employees can make you or bring you down. Of course, the, as a major that I ended up taking was quite extreme. And I remember towards the close of that year, we then had to lay off, you know, everyone out of frustration. I said, listen up, guys. We are closing out. We are laying out everyone. Like in the intro sense, everyone, and I'll call those that I'll need. I'll call those that I'll need. And I remember after laying off, I called one the technical guy and called you know the sales guy. And the team came down to about six, about six or so. Then I then realized that the sales picked up and things got a lot better, and the rest is history. But what I'm putting across is this: employees can make you or break you. And something that I learned which is extremely important from that scenario, which I want you to pick out to, is that it is not about the number of employees that you have. You can have very few employees but still be profitable. The challenge that you have as entrepreneurs within, the more the number of employees you have, the more you are growing. The number of employees I discovered, and it is a fact that it doesn't mean anything in as far as growth is concerned. Of course, you might say something, but in as far as profitability and growth is concerned, it doesn't say anything. So the number of employees says something doesn't say much. Like I can give an example of Zamtel. When Zamtel was sold to Lapre, they cut off the number of employees from 1,000 something to about 600. Profitability went very high. Efficiency levels went very high. So it is not about the number of employees. It is about how you are utilizing the employees that are there. And how are they contributing to the growth of the business. And for us who are starting out in our endeavors, in our businesses, don't worry when your employees leave you. I think there is that feeling sometimes when certain employees leave you and you start feeling very bad that maybe you are a very bad boss and what not. Here is something that I want to share with you. Of course sometimes you are very bad bosses, why employees leave you? But sometimes it is because, you see when you are starting out, you can't afford to pay your employees at the market value. Because there was a guy who came in and wanted guys out and he was like, I don't know whether I'm a bad guy or maybe I'm not a good leader. You know, employees are leaving and I don't know how to work it out. And I questioned him, just a simple question, how much are you paying them? No, it's, it's a 4,000, a 5,000 and what not. I said, listen up, a degree holder is willing to work for a 3,000. Why? Because they may not have a job to do at that particular time. But the market value for a degree holder is starting at about 8,000, 9,000 quarter. So if you are paying a degree holder less than 9,000 quarter, less than 8,000 quarter, it is just a matter of time before they leave you. Why? Because you are not paying them at that level. So it is okay sometimes when employees leave you. But one of the things that you can do is that you can keep them motivated by sharing where you want to take your business. But the importance of this line, I just wanted to indicate that when certain employees leave you when you are just starting out, it doesn't mean that you are a bad person. Sometimes it is because you are paying below the market value. And they don't want you to, uh, you do not necessarily need to strangle your leg to pay them at that level. You don't have to. If you can't afford, it is fine. 
run the rest where you can. But at least notice that if they leave you, it is because you are paying below you know, the market value. And that happens a lot. I just sort of putting that line across um, for those that are starting out. So the first thing is redefining your employees. The first point was trade softly. Manage some of these things. I made my mistakes and watch some of these mistakes. Then the second thing that I want you to look at is the room of ordinary people. The room of ordinary people. And we are still talking about employees. The room of ordinary people. <coughs> it's been said, and I believe it is true, that great businesses are not built by extraordinary people but by ordinary people who are doing extraordinary things. I repeat, great companies have not been built by extraordinary people, but by ordinary people who are doing extraordinary things. So now how do ordinary people get to achieve extraordinary things? Systems, the earlier point, you can only be able to make your ordinary employees achieve extraordinary things if you have a proper system. Now, how does this work? It ties in with the, with the point on operations. I tend to go to, so when I'm in Kitwe, I tend to go to Garden Court. Garden Court Hotel. Or maybe just where I am at Southern Sun. This is what happens. When you get in the hotel, you will notice one thing. Where the remote will be today and next week when you go on that side, is the same spot, spot where you find the remote. Where the notebook, the notepad will be, same spot. Where the pen will be, same spot. Facing the same direction. Where the cup will be, same spot same position. Where the bottles of water will be, same spot, same position. Where all these, where the footing of the buildings will be, same spot, same position. When you watch at everything that is done that side, in fact, even the heat in the room, the temperature in the room, same temperature, same everything. All these things are pre-done. There's a checklist. Ta, ta, these are things that need to be done. Now, when you have a proper operation like that, you don't need extraordinary employees to do that work. What you basically need is that ordinary employees, if they know what is supposed to be done, they'll put the remote where, where it is supposed to be put. They'll fold the beds, uh, the beds, the way they are supposed to be put. They'll put the pen where it is supposed to be put, and they'll work on this the same way. What this does, it matters less how powerful an employee is or how not so powerful an employee is when you have set out a very good system. So what is important is put a system. Once you have a good system, you will not be depending on the skills of your employees. Your employees will be depending on the system that you have created. And this ties in with the earlier point that I was talking about when, uh, when I was talking about operations. Otherwise, if you've not set this out, the neatness of your room will be dependent on the cleaner who is cleaning that particular thing. Your service will be dependent on the employee who is on duty of that day. But to avoid all that, you need to have a systematic way of doing this. And this is a lot more, uh, this is quite achievable. Nothing is very, uh, very difficult with this. This can easily uh, be achieved. And make sure that you are consistent with all the things um, that you get to do. Don't find yourself in the space of, you know, uh, the bound, uh, the bad child syndrome. Uh, who knows of the bad child syndrome? A bad child syndrome is a scenario where for two different behaviors, or for the same behavior, you reward your child for the same behavior again you punish your child same behavior what that does is that it confuses the child 
do I get rewarded for this or do I get punished for this? And that is what is called the baby child syndrome. And you have a number of parents who would say, no, stop doing that, you don't do that. The following day when the child is doing the same thing, you are, you are just quiet. That is a baby child syndrome. What that does is that the child gets confused. But the interesting thing is that the child has nowhere to go because you are the parent. But if it is a customer, a bent customer might decide to go. So as such, you must make sure that there is consistency. And for you to achieve consistency, you must make sure that the operations are well done in that regard. Then number four, I'll be getting to the fifth one. Number four, redefining for the future. Redefining for the future. At this point, you are positioning your business now you know, for the future. And this is what will tend to work out. There are three characteristics of a good strategy when you are positioning your business for the future. Number one, focus. Decide the route that you are going to take in your business and go with that route. Don't do many things. See what you can do. Run with that thing. Focus. Number two, divergence. How different are you from others? So you need to be diverted and you need to position yourself that way. Then number three, when you are defining for the future, you need a convincing tagline. As you position for the future, a convincing tagline goes a long way in positioning your business. And here's something interesting. A tagline speaks to people out there and it also speaks to people that are within the team. A tagline is like, Zesco is powering the nation. Zesco powering the nation. Zambi feeding the nation. FTA everywhere you go. LG life's good. Liverpool. I know, you wanted me to say, okay, Sanago. What are you laughing? A tagline goes a long way in speaking for you. So as you reposition your business, as you redefine the future of your business, come up with a tagline. A tagline will set you apart. And this kind of those business politicians and a tagline will go a long way. I remember in 2011, there was a powerful tagline. Powerful tagline and people voted based on the tagline. And the tagline was, more what in your what? And people went with it. More what in your what? They didn't know whether it was indeed true or it will come to pass, but people voted based on the tagline. And of course, there was another one just there, which was, don't you tell them. Don't you tell them, don't you tell them. And people voted. And not too long ago, it was uh, fixed. I'll not say uh, fixed. Whether you're fixing, big fixed, or whichever, I don't know, but I'm saying, there was a way to fix. And this, we voted based on it. Yeah. In fact, you might think it's just a certain thing. If you look, if you look at it, Barack Obama, yes, we, yes, we can. So a tagline goes a long way. If there is a speaker, there are many speakers. But there is the radical entrepreneur. It is a tagline. So <laughs> take time as you position your business to come up with a very good tagline for your business and for your operations. That is extremely important and it will help position your business. And you notice that as you position your business, results might not come up instantly. Sometimes they might take a bit of time. It might take a bit of time. But keep pushing as you position your business for the future. Because you need to realize that things that get to turn out, things that turn out to be huge sometimes take a bit of time. As an example, cancer. 80% of, you know, cancer in your body 
is undetectable. It is only that 20% when it is detectable. By the time it is detectable, it is almost too late. It has taken over your body. 80% of its life in your body, it is undetectable. As such, as you push to position your business, you may not see results sometimes instantly. But certainly, results will show in due course. And it reminds me of a stone cutter. You see when you are breaking those big stones, you will hit a stone hundred times. It won't show a crack. It, will, it won't even show that it's about to break. Hundred times you are hitting on the same spot, nothing is happening. But the hundred and first time, as you just hit it, it splits into two. Question, what has split the stone? Is it the hundred and first time or the other hundred times that you hit the stone? It is the other hundred times that you hit the stone combined with that hundred and first time. As such, as you keep pushing, you may not see results. And this is what frustrates us. We are pushing this business, results are not showing. So do you continue pushing forward or do you draw back? I would like to encourage you to say sometimes results take a bit of time to show. Then quickly, I'll get to the final point, which is redefine by meeting your customer three days from today. Redefine your business by meeting your customer three days from today. So we look at the first point which is to define your idea. The second one we looked at to define your operations. The third one we say to define your employees. The fourth one we say um, Redefine for the future. Then finally, redefine by meeting your customer three days from today. Now, here is something interesting. The A revolves around the sun. The A orbits the sun. And the A orbits the sun at a speed of 107,000 kilometers per hour. That is the speed that the Earth is going around the sun. 107,000 kilometers. That is the speed we are moving at right now. And it takes one year to go around the sun at that speed. That is the speed that the Earth is moving at. Now, as if that speed is not enough, the Earth is not just moving at that speed, it is also spinning at the same time as it is moving around the sun. And the speed with which the Earth is spinning, it is spinning at a speed of 1,670 kilometers per hour. So that is why we have the night and the day. The Earth is spinning at 1,670 kilometers. Now, 386,000 kilometers from the Earth, we have the moon. The moon is the only the earth at a speed of 3,680 kilometers. All right. Now, those are very interesting numbers that I want you to, uh, to note. Number one, the earth is moving around the sun at 107,000 kilometers per hour. Then the earth, as it is moving around the sun, it is spinning at 1,670 kilometers per hour. Then, 386,000 kilometers from the Earth, we have the moon that is going around the Earth at a very high speed of 3,683 kilometers per hour. The man decides who wants to put man on the moon. We want to go where? To the moon. We want to go and land where? To the moon. Now to move from Earth to the moon, the space structure takes three days. So when you start off today, you take three days before you land on the moon. Now here are the quick calculations that need to be done. Number one, you need to factor in that the Earth is moving at 107 thousand kilometers per hour and it is spinning 
at 1,670 kilometers per hour, and the moon is moving at a speed of 3,680 kilometers per hour, and you have to shoot in the dark with the hope of meeting the moon where it will be three days from today. Does that make sense? Because this thing is moving at 3,680 3, kilometers. And you are speeding. Right? And you have to shoot to meet this thing three days later. Man managed to do that. You shoot where the moon is not there so that you can meet with the moon three days later because you know that the moon is heading in that area. What I'm looking across with that is that you know the needs of your customers today. Don't shoot towards the needs of your customers today. Shoot towards the needs of your customers for tomorrow. Don't look at what they need today. Look at what they will need tomorrow. That is the only way you will learn where your customers are going. With your products and services, with that which you are offering the market, notice where the trend is going. Then shoot so that you can meet your customer there in three days' time. Don't just concentrate on what the customer is looking at today. The people that are revolutionary, the people that are revolutionary, are those that look at the future on which the market is going. As such, shoot where the market, uh, where the customer has not yet reached, but in the hope that in three days you will meet the customer that side. The same way they do these calculations meticulously, do all the formulas. Take that time to come up with the formulas for your business to make sure that you can execute this extremely well. What man has achieved, we can achieve also. You see, we sometimes tend to think that people that have changed the narrative of this world are totally different from us. Those powerful guys that we read in our books, we are just like yourself and myself. Nothing different. The same way they achieve is the same way we can achieve. The people that have achieved new businesses are human beings just like yourself and myself. What they have achieved, we can achieve that too. So we need to realize that the same way man was put on the moon, in our small way, we are going to land in our moons two, three days later. As you step back to your businesses, I want you to position your business in such a way that it is safe to grow big. Let us move from the business of running small businesses and being satisfied with small businesses. Let us begin looking at how we can grow our businesses with the franchise prototype such that our businesses can be replicated. A number of us can't even imagine our businesses opening branches elsewhere. I have made my mistakes, I have learned from my mistakes, and I am willing to reposition and redefine my business. With those ways, I want us to interact. I want us to interact in the remaining minutes. Oftentimes, we, we just do the talking and things end there. I think what I will do, Madam MC, is to see if people would have something to contribute, something to ask, either directed to me or to Madam Audrey Kuala. I think when, uh, wherever she is, she may please step, uh, step down so that we can interact at that level. And before you go, there will be a very important announcement that will be passed, and I would wish you to be part of that. And we'll get started from there. Where are the microphones? So we have the microphone on top there. So we have one there. Do you have any other one this side? So we have one that side. All right. So quickly. Who would wish to pass the first question? All right, okay, so if you stand my brother there in a brown thing, you can move in front, there's a mic, so just walk down there, just there on the stage, yeah. 
there's a microphone there.